and Aditya Patil. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, let me introduce uh, first uh, uh, Dr. Deepali Gupta. So uh, Deepa, uh, the Dr. Deepali is working as a professor uh, research in Chitkara University, a research and innovation network at Chitkara. Yes, uh, am I audible to all? Yes, sir. Sorry, sorry, sir. Please continue. Okay. Uh, so uh, she is having 16 years and uh, nine, uh, nine months uh, of the teaching experience. Uh, Dr. Deepali Gupta is specialized in software engineering, cloud computing, and generating algorithms. She has published more than 50 research papers in national and international journals and conferences. Based on these areas, she has guided many PhD and ME scholars. She has uh, worked at various administrative positions like uh, a principal, uh, head computer science of engineering, dean academics, IBM spoke, uh, remote sensor coordinators, coordinator for IITB spoken tutorials, executive committee members in computer science division of Haryana State Center. She is an active member of various professional bodies uh, like uh, IEI India, IETE, ISTE, apart from being editor-in-chief uh, editor of MMU Journal. She is an editorial board member and review of the various journals, reviewer of the various journals. She has conducted more than 20 workshops and uh, she has filed seven patents. She also published more than 40 papers uh, in international journals and 20 in the conferences. She is serving as a editorial board member of the journals like uh, Web Development and Web Designing, Journal of Information Technology and Sciences, Journal of Computer Science Engineering and Software Testing, International General, uh, Journal of Latest Trends in Engineering and Technology, International Journal of uh, Computational Intelligence Research. Uh, her field of interest uh, includes software engineering, cloud computing and machine learning and the blockchain. So I welcome to uh, Dr. Deepali Gupta and uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation uh, to serve as a session chair in this uh, particular session. So now uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, sorry, sir. Sorry, madam. Sorry, yep. uh, sorry for the technical delay. This is uh, Sarana Kumar, the organizing secretary for the conference. So Gajana Gupta, sir, you are now uh, made host, so you can actually uh, do all these things. So yeah. sorry. For so, on behalf of our organizing committee, I just uh, wanted to uh, welcome you once again, Madam Dr. Deepali Gupta, for sessioning this conference. So, as the session chair, what do you want to do is just you can uh, summarize all the papers and uh, at last uh, we request you to identify the best paper out of this uh, presentation papers and announce it at last uh, in the conference. So, and also I just request everyone to keep the time uh, uh, limits are uh, possible. So 12, uh, 12 minutes for each paper presentation and uh, three minutes for question answers. Let us keep it uh, very tight. And uh, So sorry for uh, coming in between. Uh, over to you, madam. OK, so first of all, a very good afternoon to everyone. And uh, I would like to thank all the organizers of uh, IRMAS for inviting me as a session chair in this conference and providing me an opportunity to be part of the session. And I hope the deliberations that will come out from this session will be useful for all the participants. And uh, I request everyone to please adhere the timings. And uh, without further delay, let us start the session so that uh, we can be bang on time. So over to you, uh, Gajanan, sir. Uh, Ma'am, you can announce to the, the first paper uh, title and then you can invite to the participants presenter. I think you have the abstract uh, file with you that the paper ID is. Yes, yes, I have that. Just okay. a second. Hmm. Okay, so, so the first paper ID I can oh. see. Uh, yeah. That uh, paper title, uh, paper ID is 21 and the uh, paper title is predictive handoff uh, management in uh, uh, vehicular networks using both weight value based and K means algorithm based a clustering algorithm to meet a desired QoS. Uh, presenter is uh, Mr. Ramalingam M. Over to you. Excuse me, sir. Uh, sir, we have to record the session also, sir. I am not able to record. Uh, it is already session. recording. It is already in okay, the, okay, okay, thank you, the cloud recording. It is there. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Ramalingo? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I will present my screen. Yes, I will present my screen. So, time limit again, I uh, request to all the participants uh, 12 minutes for presentation and uh, uh, 3 minutes for the question answer session. Is my screen visible, sir? Ah, uh, yes, visible. Please yes. proceed. Okay, right. Thank you. 
So uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, this is a mechanical uh, conference, but I am presenting a computer science, a computer science related topic here. Okay, uh, so this is uh, nothing but a, a important key uh, problem in vehicular networks. Vehicular networks, we all know that it's an automation of uh, uh, there is it is nothing but uh, vehicle to vehicle communication. So nowadays, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, recent trends, uh, uh, vehicular technology is getting evolved more, more and more, and it is getting attention in towards research. And uh, for, uh, Western countries are implementing a lot of uh, uh, innovations and uh, things are in, in case in case of vehicular communications. Whereas here we don't have that exclusive bandwidth for uh, we don't have proper traffic discipline also, and we don't have exclusive bandwidth for uh, communicating at faster rate. So that is one key uh, disadvantage in case of implementing vehicular networks in countries like India. So this uh, this problem is nothing but it's a handoff management. So which is uh, which is very common in case of wireless networks. So this is a predictive handoff management in vehicular networks using. Two algorithms, which is weight value, weight value based and k value k means algorithm based on clustering to meet desired QAs. So uh, let's have a small intro on this. So in this work, the important problem of mobile networks has been uh, taken for addressing. So in case of mobile networks, we all know that. So uh, the every mobile mobile used to travel from uh, travel at faster rate. Uh, for example, if you are traveling in a car and we'll be making a call, and uh, we 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 we'll, we we'll, we'll cover uh, because every single tower can able to cover a larger distance of not more than 1.5 kilometers, and when we uh, when we keep on moving the distance, so it, it has to switch over from one tower to another tower. So that is one uh, challenging task. So and this is nothing but the handoff management process, and uh, this is uh, this this needs to be in, uh, this needs to be part of uh, vehicular networks also because. Uh, in case of vehicular networks, we have an onboard unit, right? So onboard unit is nothing but a communication device available in the car, and this car has to be controlled uh, in, a, in a controlled through RSU. RSU is nothing but roadside unit, which is a fixed infrastructure. Whereas uh, vehicles are vehicles are uh, infrastructure less network, and the vehicles are monitored by RSUs, and RSU is monitoring the vehicles, and it has to migrate from one one RSU to another RSU because the vehicles move and move moves at faster rate. The, the the information what one per RSU will maintain has to be tried, given to the next RSU so that the quality of service. For example, if uh, if one particular vehicle is uh, uh, acquiring internet service from one RSU, it has to be maintained with the same data rate by another RSU also. So the information needs to because a vehicle travels with faster rate. So this has to be communicated to the next RSU and keep on going. So this is a very challenging task in case of vehicular network. Because every vehicle moves at faster rate, more than 150 kilometers per hour, and that is why I have taken this uh, handoff management as a bigger issue in case of vehicular network. And due to this kinetic characteristics of VANET, the nodes uh, involved in high mobility, which is not so easy to manage the nodes uh, even through clustering also. And the roadside units are used for connecting the nodes with central infrastructure. Always central infrastructure will be a, a important plays an important role because uh, the entire network because it is a completely automation process. Right, because uh, uh, the central infrastructure will kind of will have control to all RSUs in the you know, roadside uh, road, uh, RSUs in the road, and RSU will have the coverage of one one to one point five kilometers, and vehicles uh, travels in this distance will be monitored by that RSU. So it's a, a hierarchical level of control, and here three levels of hierarchy maintained in this work, and the one is nothing but the roadside unit, another one is nothing but the cluster head. Another one is nothing but the uh, cluster member. So here, cluster by the cluster heads will act as an intermediator for a roadside unit and also with the also with the color cluster members. The information that are communicated with all uh, will be uh, delivered to all respective nodes through RSUs. For example, if any of the information, because because uh, in this hierarchical level of uh, uh, data, right? It's not data. It's a it's a it's a it's a responsibility with hierarchy because this uh, control entire control will be with the uh, central uh, infrastructure. And uh, uh, we have the next level of uh, hierarchy called roadside unit, and we have next like, next level of uh, hierarchy called cluster head, and we have the uh, minimum uh, hierarchy called cluster members. So, because each, uh, we all know that uh, the managing of data can be done uh, very easily through clusters, because we need to divide it, and we can easily able to easily handle. Because uh, uh, if you want to, if you if, uh, if vehicles are uh, if vehicles uh, starts establishing, starts communicating. Uh, with every node, so it becomes uh, the network becomes a uh, two and which consumes more bandwidth also. So that becomes a tedious path, a tedious task to handle. That is why we can go for this clustering mechanism to solve this process. So if using clustering, we can able to easily handle the large network. 
so uh, because only one one cluster head will be allowed to uh, communicate with the outside world and whatever the request that comes from uh, the, within the cluster will be will be communicated to the outside world only through cluster head so uh, the clustering that's why clustering uh, the clustering has been taken as a one of the solution to solve this problem and the idea behind this work is to focus on uh, reducing the load of roadside unit and also in predicting the nodes that possibly involve in cluster to cluster movement and capturing the packets of the particular node to avoid packet loss so as i said here the uh, here the method that is used here is predicted handoff which means so for example if uh, as i already said uh, rsu can able to cover a distance of not more than 1 to 1.5 kilometers and that rsu uh, uh, will predict because uh, the prediction uh, here the predicted handoff is Uh, we don't uh, because the neighboring rsu doesn't know about any vehicle that comes in future right so the the movement of the vehicle will be predicted and uh, the based on the coverage distance right because the rsu coverage distance as i said it is 1.5 kilometers and if the vehicle is close to the border right and it is predicted automatically uh, based on the because every node will have its own gpu location sharing Uh, because all this the rsu will control the entire uh, coverage distance right whatever the vehicles that is travel under the uh, distance of under the coverage of this rsu based on the location of the vehicle location of the vehicle it is predicted that so it is going to involve in handoff which means uh, the, this in this vehicle will move out of this range so this has to be communicated to the next rsu so that the quality of service demanded by the particular vehicle can be uh we uh, can be maintained without any sacrifice so that is that is the uh, important one and the important uh, uh, prediction that needs to be done here the ip scheme used here for information exchanges uh, we need to have as i said it is a hierarchical level of information right hierarchical level of network so here three levels of hierarchy rsu cluster head and cluster member this rsu will play an important role that's why uh, that's why it, it has because more number of rsus needs to be maintained so uh, it is it has been done in uh, a simulator right and this cannot be implemented in real time uh, this has been executed and done in simulator this rsu and id needs to be maintained right so which is nothing but a 16 bit this is a proposed scheme right so rsu id needs to be maintained with 16 bits of information and uh, the cluster head will be allotted with 8 bits of information and the cluster member will be allotted with 8 bits of information together with uh, 32 bits so we are maintaining 16 8 and 8 for each of this and this rsu will be allotted with 16 bits used for representing the unique rsu in the entire network and the cluster head also similarly so 8 bits will be used for unique cluster head id and cluster members will be allotted with 8 bits so together this all 32 bits will be used for uniquely identifying a node in the network which conveys a, which rsu currently resides and the and also the class, current cluster head for example using this 32 bit i can able to easily locate one particular uh, vehicle in the entire network and uh, i can able to easily say which rsu it belongs to and which cluster head it, it, it is currently holding on so all this information i can able to easily say about, while using this uh, 32 bits proposed scheme and to perform effective communication lots of information will be maintained at rsu level because rsu needs to maintain all this information to to monitor uh, the vehicles that travels in the coverage distance so it has to maintain this medium access control id and it has to maintain this all this pa 32 bit of information so which rsu it belongs to uh, what is the cluster head it is my it is under the control and what is the cluster member all this information needs to be maintained by the rsu and the ipv4 address assigned by rsu excuse me sir uh, two minutes remaining sir uh, please yes, uh, make it pass so and the trust value of the node speed of the vehicle signal strength uh, gpu location mac address and a special bit to represent whether the uh, node is a cluster head or not so all these information needs to be maintained at the rsu level so that the communication can be effective with uh, complete uh, control of the entire network and each rsu will track of the cluster cluster heads under its control and similarly cluster heads also keeps track of members under it under it using the following information using mac id only it is able to control the entire network and ip address assign and rsu also maintain some information about neighboring rsus by handling by having the information of mac id of neighboring rsu and also ip address of the neighboring rsu and the cluster heads will be nominated as per the procedure of work 1 and work 2 here the work 1 uh, this is nothing but this is a, one of my uh, research work and uh, this uh, work 1 is nothing but the weighted clustering algorithm and uh, work 2 is nothing but the uh, k means algorithm both are my proposed works and uh, this proposed algorithms uh, is are nothing but it is it is make it is used one for minute cluster. remaining sir 
it is used for clustering of information and predicted handoff occurs when um, node moves out of cluster and cluster head wants to leave uh, its uh, role right and nodes in the border of the cluster head are also cluster heads which is in the border of rsu has been predicted as nodes likely to move in handoff process as i said it is predicted and it will move it will involve in handoff process uh, as early as possible so it has to be communicated to the neighboring rsu so that uh, the arrival of the new node will be known to the rsu and uh, the, this is what uh, as i said here uh, the predicted handoff will be done only through uh, these two information one is relative speed of the vehicle and then i think uh, next one is nothing but the gp location so using this and this is the parameters i have used uh, here the network simulator i have used is ns2 sir excuse me sir sir yes. time is over sir okay. yeah uh, just another one minute yes complete uh, results are waiting uh, uh, network simulator is ns2 and uh, i have used the traffic simulator which is nothing but the sumo simulator and uh, here are the results so uh, because i have used as i said uh, weighted clustering algorithm and kenning's algorithm so it is observed that uh, uh the uh, the weighted clustering algorithm uh, the is uh, that is a uh, uh, kenning's algorithm is producing uh, as efficiency as possible and uh, in case of this latency compared to rest of the algorithms the predicted handoff will work uh, with a better uh, performance in case of kenning's and uh, as the summary the product uh, the protocol proposed predictive mechanism performed well in highway scenario with weighted clustering to srb and uh, maintained uh, uh, good results in case of muted kenning's algorithm and this prediction will help in achieving good desired qas in case of maintaining uh, good quality of service so when it uh, when it acts and it gets internet services from rsus and here is the conclusion and uh, uh, this is uh, the future work and uh, these are all the references okay thank you sir thank you sir so uh, thank you any queries from the participants okay so uh mr ramalingam can you please uh, tell me the strategy to make these cluster heads um, i yes. just want to know the strategy to make the cluster heads from um, cluster head it has specific characteristics which means uh, it has to be uh, it, uh, out of the uh, for example if uh, in a common range common range of uh, vehicles the node with highest energy and highest battery power will be nominated as cluster head because it has to maintain lot of information it has to play important role uh, because it it will it will forward the messages what cluster members are generating because in case of a network so it, it is not permitted to all to start, all to involve in communication it becomes a very uh, tedious process because net consume, every node will consume more amount of bandwidth so only restricted cluster heads are permitted to uh, permitted to communicate with outside world so this cluster head with more energy and more battery uh, battery power will be nominated as cluster head so this cluster head will be among the uh, other cluster members right yes 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 exactly right okay and uh, can you please tell me the basis for choosing this ipu scheme because it has to uniquely identify it right so in case of a network i i need to because as i said it is a three level of hierarchy one is mm -hmm. nothing but rsu another one is nothing but cluster gate another one is nothing but cluster member so we need to uniquely identify uh, which node under which cluster head and under and under and under, under uh, which rsu so all these needs to be uniquely identified that's why i have allotted eight bits for cluster member eight bits for cluster head head and eight uh, 16 bits for rsu so to uniquely identify one particular node in the network okay so uh, you have used uh, k means algorithm yes what all mechanisms have been proposed in literature ma other than k means algorithm what all mechanisms or algorithms have been used in the past ma uh, uh, already a lot of researches has been done uh, based on lot of clustering algorithm lot of researches has been done and this mutated k means and weighted clustering algorithm is proper this is one of my research work and uh, already two works which is nothing but weighted clustering and uh, uh, pro, uh, mutated k means uh, both are my proposed work algorithms and uh, this is the continuation of the work so that's why i have used only these two uh, these two uh, clustering algorithms okay okay fine so that is all from my side good work thank, thank you, you so much so we can have our next presenter Uh, sir uh, gajananda sir next presenter can you announce yes so uh, next is presenter the... sir okay, fine. you please continue paper id number 
uh, simulating uh, solitary foraging behavior of uh, a chimpanzee in hunting red colobus monkeys using agent based modeling approach a presenter is norcia fiak edros uh, uh, hi hi uh, um, sorry uh, one and... minute uh, sorry 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 in one minute so yes. what we request everyone please switch on whenever you are presenting try to switch on your video and present uh, and uh, please maintain the time limit okay thank you okay i share my my screen yeah please you can share can see my screen everyone yes visible visible okay i start my presentation um Uh, hi and good day to all of you. My name my name is Noor Shafika Idris and I am a master student from University of Central Malaysia, Malaysia. And today I will be presenting my work entitled Simulating Solitary Foraging Behavior of Chimpanzee in Hunting Red Colobus Monkeys Using Agent-Based Modeling Approach. Okay. In this presentation, I would like to talk about introduction and then followed by literature review, methodology implementation, uh, and then results and finally conclusion. First of all, the aim of my work is to simulate the solitary foraging behavior of chimpanzee in hunting red colobus monkey. Why did I choose to simulate this animal's behavior? This is because from the definition of swarm intelligence itself, which is the action of mimicking animal's intelligence behavior. The future of this modeling is to come up with new algorithm which is capable to solve um, optimization problem. Uh, chimpanzee hunts monkey, specifically red colobus monkey as its prey. Note that uh, chimpanzee favors young red colobus monkeys as compared to the old ones. In this work, the simulation has been done using NetLogo version 6.0.4. And uh, this is the face of NetLogo before I run the simulation. The, the red arrow here indicates a chimpanzee and white faces here indicates a red colobus monkey. Uh, and then these four sliders, which are chances towards image monkey, chances towards lower age, dominance and active, weight as, uh, add as weightage in this simulation. Uh, another two slider, which are number of chimpanzee and number of monkey, are applied to control the population of these two animals. And then this, the mass of red colobus monkey is put there for easiness. And then the, the graph here is to, is to see the, the number of monkeys left across the time, while this is used to track the ID and the mass of red colobus monkey for each simulation. As... um. Every time I click setup before before run the simulation, the mass will always change. So so that's why I I put that as a I put the graph there to just for information. And then in this simulation, the task has been divided by four, which is number one to show chimpanzee prefer the lightest monkey, and then task number two to determine the 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 frequency of sound produced by monkey. And then num number three, to determine the tendency of chimpanzee to hunt its prey. And number four, to show chimpanzee only catch one prey per kill. This is the, the result for task one. The simulation has been repeated five times for accuracy. In this task, the, the weight of chances towards image monkey, the weight of chances towards lower age, and weight of active has been fixed to 0 0.3, 0 0.99, and 5 respectively. Based on this figure, uh, we can see that chimpanzee hunted the lightest monkey. This has been proven by the shortest time interval of monkey in the simulation as compared to the heavier monkey. For example, monkey A, uh, with mass 8 kg was in the simulation for 200 ticks, while monkey B that has mass um, 14 kg was in the simulation world for 450 ticks. And then um, the result for task 2, which is to determine the frequency of sound production by monkey. The manipulated variable for, for this task is weight of active, which is set to 5, 15, 24, 30, and 45. 
As the weight of active is increased, the sound production by monkey is more frequent, thus notifying the chimpanzee. This is because uh, the chimpanzee's main approach is through their ears to notice the monkey. And note that the sound the, the, the sound produced here is referred to the to the sound from the branches, not from the not from the mouth of monkeys. And logically, when weight of active is high, chimpanzee requires shorter time to hunt as compared to when weight of active is is low. But in this figure, the result shows subsequently, which is um, the monkey that has mass 16 kilogram was in the simulation world for 460 ticks when weight of active is at 5 and 590 ticks when weight of active is 24. This, this, have, this is because um, the sound produced is encouraged chimpanzee to alert the presence of monkey, not to hunt the monkey that that presents the eh, not to hand the monkey that produce the sound so that means in in in, in this task the, the the result show when this is happen the number of younger monkey is high when when the weight of active is at five so um chimpanzee will will still hand the, the lightest monkey in the simulation world next the the result for task three, the manipulated variable for for this task is weight of chances towards immature monkey, which was set to 0 0.3, 0 0.5, and 0 0.9. It can be seen clearly that when weight of chances towards immature monkey is 0 0.3, the 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 monkey was in the simulation world longer, which is 1000 ticks as compared to when the weight of chances towards immature monkey was 0 0.9 which is 600 ticks this happened for the reason that when when weight of chances is at 0 0.3 the probability of chimpanzee to hunt mature monkey is low and the last one is result for task 4 which is under uh, when when chimpanzee is hungry Initially, the number of monkey is fixed at 25 and based on the simulation, the chimpanzee hunted only one monkey at one time. The, the number of monkey remains unchanged until 50 ticks. This is because the chimpanzee is full. Under, under non-hungry condition, the chimpanzee will ignore the monkeys and patrol. Thus, no occurrence of hunting activity. Um, based on based on these four results, it can be concluded that the simulation of solitary foraging behavior of chimpanzee is very verified, which are simulation result for task one display chimpanzee preferred the lightest monkey, and then the simulation result for task two showed the sound produced encourage chimpanzee to alert the presence of monkey, and then the simulation result for task three revealed that low weightage resulted low probability of chimpanzee to hunt mature monkey, and the last one the simulation result for task four exhibit that chimpanzee only hunt one monkey at a time. Um, that's that's all for me. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, okay. uh, Mr. Dros. Yes. So, is there any questions from audience? Uh, Dipali, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, very well presented. Thank you. So, um, it was a different topic. Um, <coughs> Marcia, can you please uh, tell me uh, what is the motivation behind this work? Motivation behind this work? Um, if uh, there, there are so many algorithms that has been introduced by re researchers over the world and it is based on the be behavior of animals like uh, meerkat foraging behavior and raccoon optimization algorithm and this algorithm uh, cannot solve cannot solve more than one optimization problem for each algorithm so uh, 
the the researchers need to come up with new algorithm in order to in order to to solve more of more optimization problems that occur yeah that's that's why uh, this is the in in order to come up with new algorithm uh, first we 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 have to simulate the behavior behavior first we we have to test whether, whether the simulation is success or not yeah i got your point uh, nausha can the results which you have obtained so far like you have obtained you have performed these four tasks and the results you have obtained have not been obtained earlier do you think so uh yes because you just wanted the, to know about the novelty of your research work uh yes because none of the the researcher has come up with this chimpanzee's algorithm so uh, no one has worked on chimpanzee's algorithm you want to say that yes so i think um, it should not be the case because uh, a lot of research has been done upon chimpanzees so uh, maybe um, something else you want to say oh. you are a phd you are uh, uh, you are pursuing your doctorate oh uh, master master so okay. yes so acha uh, tell me one thing what is the significance of this monkey's weight in your work oh yes So, 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 what sorry. is the significance of monkey's weight in your work? Monkey's weight. Monkey's weight. Um. Uh, we we know that chimpanzee will prefer the younger monkey compared to the older one. So the weight is to is as the indicator that 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 means when when the weight of monkey is is low. that is the younger monkey ha huh? yes okay okay so that is all from my side thank you so much thank over you. to you gajanan sir thank you okay uh, thank you so the next paper id is uh, 61 uh, driver assessment system using artificial intelligence the uh, presenter is muthu kumar m so can i can share screen yeah you can share your screen is it possible sir yeah it's possible please proceed yeah hi everyone this is mithu kumar i'm one of us in my work uh, driver assessment system is in artificial intelligence as uh, title suggests i'm me working developing a system to assess a uh, driver using our advanced artificial intelligence as you know artificial intelligence is booming every day in the day to day uh, using artificial intelligence in place of assessment will be more uh, reliable and more Uh, justified in nature so i will be uh, developing the system for uh, new drivers like uh, uh, when you are when you are under uh, when you are under professional license or you are when you are going to take some license such system will uh, really be protecting our uh, safer environment so uh, i will just uh, uh, just a second sorry to disturb you actually uh, you uh, kindly unzoom your window because there is too much of zooming and your contents are not properly visible is it okay now ma'am so okay fine yeah yeah i have been using this artificial intelligence to uh, to judge the drivers so Yeah, uh, driver skills. Uh, I've been surfing through the various papers related to uh, artificial intelligence in assessing a driver. I've been come across a lot of those. Uh, some of them uh, has been uh, very useful and very informative to develop this work. And most of them was patent. But the end product of those papers has been different. Like uh, their outcome is has to be for reducing the uh, driving skill atrophy. or they have been done in that assist developing that system for a better ergonomics uh, and handling my purpose of this paper is to 
uh, assess a person before getting licensing. Yes, my objective is to develop an, uh, an independent portable system which could uh, get uh, data from your uh, vehicle, which is which is fitted uh, portably to your own independent vehicle and will get a predefined. Uh, when we have a we, we have a predefined model to analyze uh, how good uh, how how, how skilled uh, driver are. Yeah, I'm doing this as a portable independent system uh, because uh, it might be useful uh, to for better uh, usage. Like we can uh, use it for. You, you can use it in every cars. Like uh, if your person is under uh, licensing, you can use them in for a uh, for the period of time, and we can uh, hire rent them back or like that. So I've been developing this as a portable system. Uh, my methodology is like uh, first uh, determining the process. Uh, what what are the process? What are the ideology I'm I'm going to assess? What are the kind kind of uh, skills I'm going to assess? And later I've been uh, collecting data for uh, from various drivers for various conditions. Um, to understand the logics of a skilled driver and unskilled driver, and I developed a model and I developed a system to uh, enrich this all, uh, engroup this all into a system. So, uh, as far as the research in August is concerned, I have been taking uh, two skills like steering assessment and acceleration deceleration assessment. Uh, I, uh, each group, uh, each skill is, uh, I mean, developing each skill is a different module. So. Each has a different sensor, different uh, subcontrollers, uh, which will be giving their uh, data and uh, and their uh, determination to a master controller. So this is my over overview set of my uh, bit hardware. Uh, my, my framework of this pro program of the system is like uh, uh, when we start the system, it will first uh, go on for a driver identification because uh, it should ensure that uh, the person person is uh, under uh, driving. So so that should be in a login authorization. So I will be implemented a driver identification. It's just a, uh, a predefined model I imported. And then uh, my system will be uh, they, uh, voicing out the general instructions and other uh, things uh, to start the trips. Then once the trip is started, uh, uh, various sensors I've been using will collect the data from all modules. And, and uh, from the, uh, at the end of the trip, uh, that model will be uh, the data will be given to the model and uh, results will be given out of the uh, developed uh, model and we have a, a database in the system so it will store the uh, resultant of the of the trip and and at the end point of the program i have like uh, if you are certain about the criteria like you are very well skilled uh, you can the system will be uh, give, washing out like uh, Yes, uh, you are very skilled. You can propose it for your uh, next process. Uh, if not, means uh, you, you will be suggested to take more trips like that. Uh, for this uh, test condition, I have been taken three conditions, uh, as I stated here, and uh, various uh, type of drivers, various age groups of drivers, and uh, experience of drivers have been uh, has been used to get uh, data for this system. Uh, I've been using, uh, as far as uh, the resource concerned, I've been uh, using these uh, hard bars uh, and these placement systems. Uh, I have taken real-time data from a reserved environment. Uh, so these are the hard bar setup I used, uh, and uh, this is the position I have placed. And from collected data, I've been extracting uh, the very standard basic features from all this data. Uh, to find the some to, to form a model uh, to judge a logic between a, a skilled and unskilled drivers. So for a, for a feature selection, I've been using recursion feature elimination technique. Uh, uh, this is one of uh, uh, one of the best technique to select features. Uh, uh, this technique uses uh, first uh, reduces the highly correlated variables first, and then it will reduce the zero correlated variables. That is like a Process variables. They, they will be reducing the process variables so that the model will be more accurate in the uh, end product. So I've been using this recursion feature elimination technique. As a result of this recursion elimination technique, I got uh, this result as uh, this result for a steering assessment, uh, steering assessment, and this result for access and deceleration assessment. This ranking at the end shows uh, the 
decision uh, there will be uh, there will, i'll be forming a decision tree for in recursion that decision tree will be telling that uh, the high, highly ranked uh, variables will be more uh, useful in getting more accurate accurate model so this system uh, will eliminate the uh, correlated model here you can see that uh, green and red thing if 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 the uh, if a feature is passed uh, if a feature is passed in highly correlated elements, I will post it that green. If that was eliminated, means uh, I will get that as green. Like that, uh, I'll be formed. I, I had uh, formed a model with respect to the decision tree ranking that RFE take uh, as given. And accuracy of my system for a steering system, uh, I got accuracy of uh, some 98.33 for a steering system in KK and weighted and ensemble batteries technique. And for acceleration decision assessment, I got around 90 percentage accuracy in a ensemble bag tree techniques. So uh, at the end, for to go to wrap up all, uh, I have been developing a uh, front end of my system. So I have I have used some basic uh, GUI creation for my project so that the user will be more interactive to the systems. And yes, uh, this portable inner system. Uh, would be very helpful if we, if as an implementer like uh, building a better skilled uh, drivers on road uh, and, and and as far as my concern uh, i have been developed uh, steering steering skills and assessment skills for those 98.30 and 90 uh, 90 uh, 90 percent have been obtained and future work of this project might be uh, assessing uh, several other uh, skills and implementing some uh, uh, traffic rules based uh, assessment can be done in future to end it's the output of my projects. Yes, yeah, so thank you for your patience and thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Muthu. So, is there any query from audience? Okay, uh, ma'am, please. So it was a very good problem uh, which you addressed Muthu Kumar and uh, may I know you are a PhD scholar or uh, ME scholar? Masters. 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 Master. So um, can you show me your literature review? I want to see the latest paper which you have referred for this study. Oh. Uh, Actually, my as I said, uh, most of the systems related to, to these things have been patented things. So I stated here. Yeah, uh, are you asking for uh, patent papers? So the latest one is of 2014. Yes, that is me. Uh, like uh, we don't have anything specific to my output, ma'am. Like these are things related to my project, but their outcome is different. So um, actually, uh, my outcome is to assess a driver for licensing. So that kind of uh, output, I didn't get that much of uh, papers, uh, I, uh, standard papers out for reply. So I've been using these uh, such uh, big uh, patents for my efforts. That is and in, uh, as far as concerned, uh, this area of research has been limited. But I would suggest you should go for more latest and relevant papers related to your study so that you can see what is happening now. Because 2000, 2014 yes, to 2021, the time span is big. So, um, I mean, yes. uh, what challenges you faced while data collection? I mean, because it was tough job uh, for collecting data. So what yes, you did? What challenges you face? Actually, faced? for uh, to be more logical, I should have been doing a simulation to get data. We have some uh, some high-end software simulations, uh, real-time driving simulations uh, in research R and D. Uh, those automotive companies have that kind of uh, allocations and all. But as I'm as a master student, I could uh, afford that to do. So I have been doing this uh, with a closed environment track. Uh, there has been a GACL, some road testing track is available here on my near side. So I've been using that track for a while uh, with, a, with a variety of drivers to uh, take data. And my setup is almost uh, like a very basic things like 
this has been i'm doing I this around the, in I my uh, uh, it is well clear i just wanted to know the size of the data set which you have used for your study size of the data set uh, for a uh, for each conditions uh, which each driver has been taking a uh, 15 hours uh, 15 number of their uh, tests mm -hmm. for each condition with each drivers how many images do you took not like images man uh, it's like a uh, data from sensor sir i have been uh, around uh, e for each conditions i have been doing with uh, 50 50 50 times for each drivers man okay so uh, what you see as a future scope of your work Uh, my future school, I, as I see, like uh, uh, I have just implemented the skill-based assessment. In future, I could uh, implement uh, traffic-based assessment. Like, are you really following some traffic rules, or uh, you are very strict to a traffic? Like, that kind of norms can be imposed. And further, this uh, studying this depth of an uh, uh, driving skill could uh, promote uh, autonomous driving also. like uh, it could teach you by dri uh, driving so like that uh, autonomous uh, setting intense about driving skills uh, might path way for autonomous driving okay okay fine that's all from my side over to you okay, sir okay thank you uthu thank you uh, so the next paper you, id sir. is uh, paper id 66 iot based intelligent control of hydrophonic setup for uh, live stock rearing Uh, presenter is Mr. Arjun S. V. Arjun, yes, are you there? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Arjun, please share your screen. So is my screen visible? Yes, visible. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Arjun Esri, and I'm doing uh, my research on IoT-based intelligent control of hydroponic setup for livestock rearing. Actually, it is a uh, uh, more. Arjun, of... please uh, zoom out, Karwa, because बहुत बहुत big screen आपकी visible है, so kindly zoom out your screen. Uh, and can you see right now? Uh, is it is it fine? Or it is? Make it small. Um, uh, or is is this fine for you? No, more smaller. Not able to view the full screen. Yes, smaller now. For my system, I think it is. Uh, this is visible clearly. Uh, sorry, madam. Uh, you have to uh, maximize the. Uh, you just uh, maximize the window so that it fits the entire window so that you can see it clearly. Okay. 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 Fine. Okay, Arjun. Please proceed. Uh, my uh, my research topic is uh, IoT based intelligent control of hydroponic setup for livestock rearing. This uh, more uh, oriented to IoT and uh, uh, prototype development. of a uh, hydroponic setup so uh, basically uh, what is hydroponic water means um, uh, we used to grow with these green uh, grams just by spraying water on them and some sprouts will come out of it and we lead it the you, uh, you might have heard that it is very healthy to humans more similar to it what uh, these uh, people who grow cattle will do is like they'll just buy some corn seed they'll just spray water and some sprouts will come out of it then they will give the feed to uh, cattle which is very uh, healthier to them uh, that is my uh, completely automating a large scale development of that thing is my uh, research area uh, the reason is that the land for cultivating uh, food for this uh, food for these kind of uh, cattle has becoming very less and the cattle feed has become uh, prices of cattle feed has been uh, become uh, very high so uh, the, the people who are growing cattle are expecting something like this so that they can uh, grow their own feed and uh, feed their cattle in a smaller area in un, mainly in urban cities because in urban cities if they have to get these kind of quarters for cattle they have to invest a lot of money in transport so this is my basic introduction about what is hydroponic powder uh, 
uh, uh, actually uh, hydroponic pot is uh, mainly based on only water they don't use any kind of uh, sand or something they just take the seed and they'll just spray the water uh, and it will sprout out they will just keep it for 7 days and then they'll feed the cattle so uh, my uh, research area uh, as it is oriented to hydroponics i just saw a lot of uh, papers but a lot of hydroponics papers are uh, based on commercial crops like uh, tomato and then uh, this brinjal uh, and other green things which human seed not the cattle seed so uh, there was a hu- heavy lack of uh, papers on uh, growing uh, crops for uh, these kind of cattle so but uh, still i just took a lot of data from these uh, guys so that it will be very helpful for me uh, so these are the paper which i referred which are uh, basically this iot and intelligent system based so uh, in this picture you, in the right side you can clearly, clearly see uh, what is hydroponic water this is how they grow just by spraying water actually this is commercially available what the system does is like it will only spray water every one hour it will not monitor your uh, ph it will not monitor the amount of nutrients present it will not uh, say you uh, whether this water is needed for it or not because in rainy season you don't have to spray water for every uh, uh, one hour so these kind of limitations are there this is the commercial available and it is a large space where uh, not a lot of researchers uh, researchers are focusing on so i just took this space and i just wanted to implement a complete setup uh, which can monitor and control uh, all these things so main main ob- uh, objective is to develop iot based uh, artificial intelligent uh, integrated control system for the following water spraying ph of water water level ambient light present humidity and nutrition level of the complete system and to develop a web based application uh, which people can just uh, open up and see uh, their water spraying level and ph and water level and everything through that and in case of any emergency they can switch on the pump or uh, they can switch on uh, of the lights or switch off the complete uh, setup so this was my uh, primary objective and then uh, the social impact of it is uh, the primary uh, Uh, beneficiaries are the marginal farmers livestock cow duck hen goat horse everything they need food now so they have to invest a lot of money so they can easily go for it sheep rearing and dairy dairy farms are like uh, present all over the city so they are in heavy need of uh, this kind of uh, product so methodology area of research and uh, this is the methodology what we followed and then workflow uh, to get clearly into the workflow i'll just go to the another diagram in this we can clearly see how it works actually uh, we have a set of sensors connected to node mc and it will send data to raspberry pi which is the primary uh, control unit and that will send data to the cloud and we can access everything through mobile or any web uh, supporting uh, uh, instrument and then we have the actuators which just switch on your pump solar walls and led lights and everything which will grow the a pump and we also use a camera image processing to uh, see whether if uh, any on us uh, any interruption is happening in between the scene so this is this is the basically the ideology of uh, what we are going to make a barrel uh, which will contain water and other nutrition uh, in case of the ph is going down we can add the ph plus and minus solutions and uh, for nutrition we are going to pour this fungal ave solution and everything and the water will come out from the water tank and uh, it will pour into it and the entire mixture will mix inside the barrel and then it will ta- be taken out and it will be given to the um, uh, fodder side the fodder we can see the spraying of water to the fodder for a set of 7 days and the end of 7 days 1 kg of uh, the corn seeds will grow up to 14 kg of corn crops so that that can be fed to the cattle within the span of 7 days that's the most beautiful thing about this uh, fodder technique and then for this uh, we have used a lot a large set of sensors and everything we'll just uh, look at it uh, this is a cat design of how it, because we just spent a lot of time designing how it should look and we are uh, we very focused on how the product should look and then uh, this is a small animation video before uh, uh, ma- before started uh, fabricating the product we just uh, made a video of how it should be so it will be very useful to understand what we are doing about by seeing this video this is the barrel inside which the water will be and the water will be taken out and it will be pumped and it will be sprayed to the fodder uh, in which the corn seeds will be kept so 
so by the by the end of 70s we we'll, can see a good growth of the crops so these are the sensor boxes i'll just uh, talk about what are the sensor we have used uh, in this uh, box and these are the places where the ps plus minus solution and the nutrition will be kept and uh, if the nutrition goes down if the sensor detects it it will pour from these boxes this is a rearing manager uh, prototype product uh, which we are developing so i think so you people might have got some idea what we are developing right now and okay these are the components which we actually bought and we just started okay let us see what are the sensors used and what are the action it will do uh, the ph sensor to regulate ph by rising or reducing it and turbidity turbidity is basically the total dissolved solids uh, if we take a water and we dip the sensor it will tell amount of uh, solids inside the water so that with that we can recognize the amount of nutrition in, into it if the tds goes down it means that the nutrition present is going down uh, or if the tds goes up we can identify uh, there are uh, enough uh, nutrition in the water but uh, we can uh, say like if the turbidity goes up, up and down uh, it may even detect that uh, uh, if it goes very high it may even direct, uh, detect that there are some dissolved metals inside it so that uh, even we can uh, identify it through that uh, we can identify the uh, quality of the water and then the dst22 sensor to maintain the moisture it is basically a moisture sensor if the moisture level goes below 80 percentage it will automatically detect it and it will say like uh, just switch on the pump so that it will get uh, some water sprinkled over it to maintain the moisture level of the corn seeds and then uh, to maintain the ambient light we have used this ps1750 uh, sensor and float switches are mainly used to maintain the water level in the barrel if it goes down it will automatically switch on the uh soil nerve also that it will fill it so this is the prototype manufacturing where you can see a barrel and the fodder system and float switch and the two sensor boxes in which one uh the moisture sensor and ambient sensor will be integrated and the another box in which the ph sensor turbidity sensor and everything will be more. yeah uh, this all will be directed uh, this is a complete setup and there you can see um, a desktop setup which controls the complete uh, environment so this is basically the user interface which we developed for uh, this system and which we can uh, easily see uh, from anywhere actually this is from local host we can uh, publish it to the internet through ngorp there is a solution for it like uh, just it will integrate it through any website which we uh, which we like, would like to integrate it with and uh, these are the tabs and these are the manual controls see which uh, we can manually control what is happening uh, there and actually uh, the thing is that uh, this as this uh, problem has not been identified uh, by many researchers uh, the data collection process is being uh, happening right now to integrate any other uh, machine learning algorithms uh, because uh, we have to collect a large set of data for agriculture so it's been about uh, two months uh, right now and still we are collecting the data from the sensors and everything right now just uh, ifl statement uh, is uh, going through it and thank you captain uh thank you mr arjun so any query from audience okay uh, ma'am please so it was a very uh, wonderful concept and um, can you please uh, tell me what is this panchakavya panchakavya is actually a substitute for urea ma'am because uh, we wanted to grow plants in uh, organic way so that we are using panchakavya it is actually substitute for urea which contains this komutra and uh, cow dung and everything uh, inside it if we mix it with water we can easily identify the tds so it is a kind of nutrient you can say yeah yeah it is a nutrient okay okay so um uh, can you tell me the uh, at what interval the water is sprinkled i missed that actually like seven days uh, within seven days that uh for the grows now right so yeah. what is the interval you are spr sprinkling water yeah actually in commercial they spring uh, sprinkle water for every one hour what what we are doing is like we are sensing the moisture if the moisture level goes 
below 80% it will sprinkle because in rainy season the moisture will automatically maintain in the environment and during in summer season the moisture will go out very easily so we need water spraying for every half an hour so that we are also managing the water and also we are uh, conserving water in one place after 7 days how much uh, matlab what quantity of water is produced actually ma'am uh, we are just using two folders only in 7 days for two folders only uh, uh, about 20 liters of water is being used but normally uh, what other uh, people are wasting is about uh, 30 to 40 liters so we are saving 10 liters so actually i didn't project any uh, uh, this kind of uh, numbers here because still the data collection process is going on so i can inter okay. interpret at this time. so so are you planning to file some patent also Yes, ma'am. The, the main problem is like uh, it, the system is completely available for some other uh, product and some other solution. For this solution, no one has produced. So there are some uh, problems in filing patent to it. But I am trying trying to convert it as a product. But I think you can file the patent because uh, it's a good idea, and you can go for it. Okay. So you can go and talk to your authorities regarding patent filing. because i think uh, this patent is not available up till now okay uh, and you can check on google patent as well so because okay. it is not available up till now okay so thank you thank you it okay. was a good presentation uh, thank you so much thank you mr arjun uh, for a nice presentation so the next paper is uh, paper id 72 overview of quantum prairie smart systems driven by open design movement uh, by mr aditya medhi Aditya Medhi are there? Yes, sir. Yeah, please share your screen. So, is it visible? Not now. Sir, I have shared my screen. Uh, is it visible? No, it's not coming. Okay, so, when I'll sir, try again, one minute. Sharing and again share. Yeah, now it's coming. I think there is some network delay at your end. Ah uh, yes, yeah, sir. it's coming now. Okay, please proceed. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you all are safe and sound in whichever part of the globe you are. I am Aditya Medhi from College of Engineering, Pune. I am in my final year of mechanical engineering uh, graduation, and today I'll be presenting a review article on the topic overview of contemporary smart systems driven by open design movement. The co-authors of this review article are Abhishek Patange, Sujit Pardeshi, Aditya Patil, Ruvved Vaksaure, and Rudesh Shehu from College of Pune, and Dr. Jagdish Varan from Vellore Institute of Technology. so by the end of this presentation you will know what exactly open design movement is what motivated me for going behind this movement so some of the initiatives related to open design movement which are currently available on the internet some of the related work done by researchers till date in open design movement summary of the related work findings and future scope some illustrations of open source hardware followed by references what is open design movement well you all might think that this movement is very old hello uh, aditya i think there is some network delay at your end uh, please reshare your screen uh, yes sir there is some uh, okay so one minute Uh, you can do one thing uh, you can just switch off your webcam and uh, share your screen so bandwidth okay, will be less yeah so is it visible it will come yeah it's coming now okay okay please proceed so due to some technical problem it's been delay Yeah, so when I was talking about open design movement, uh, so it was coined by three people. So they established this open source as an alternative version for free software. So basically, we are dealing with free softwares. 
Now it focuses on creation of hardware and software using information which is available to all. Now this internet development is performed without any monetary compensation. So thus, I would like to say that co-creation, where the final product is designed by the users rather than an external stakeholder such as a private company. Coming to open source software, open source software releases a source code using a permit in which the grant is given to the consumers to study, change, distribute, and use the software by the patent holder for any purpose. Now it is easily and freely available to all on the internet. For instance, one could simply go to the official website of Python and download the software for free. Moreover, some of the open source softwares also offer free training courses to get acquainted with the software. So this model is a decentralized software development and is a perfect apotheosis of what I call as open collaboration. So some of the examples are Python. Python is a high level general purpose and interpreted programming language. Clear and logical code can be written for various small and large scale projects because of its language constructs and object oriented approach. The next is Raspbian. It is a Debian based operating system for the device Raspberry Pi. It includes a version of Wolfram Mathematica, a program in a Pi edition of Minecraft, and a lightweight version of Chromium web browser. Other examples are Kyle C, Visual C, Apache, Sun Tracking, Freescale, VSM, Zimbra, and Sugar CRM, to name a few. Open source hardware. It consists of physical artifacts of technology which are designed and offered under this movement. Now, people can easily make the hardware at the comfort of their homes because the logic designs and hardware description language code is shared with the public. So, OpenBeam, Wikihouse, Hovelin, Prusa, RepRap are some of the examples of this hardware. Now, what motivated me to go for this movement? First of all, it's its collaborative nature. We all can interact, share, gain knowledge from members of the community. So I think this is the best way of learning and growing. Second, low cost and readily available everywhere. Third, they can also be combined with property software. Now the last, the best thing that fascinated me towards this movement is that you do not need to communicate in the same language. You can belong to different countries and could still collaborate effectively. For example, if an Indian researcher wants to collaborate with a German, he or she can easily do it and come out with a paper which is as effective as what he could do back at home. So this is the best thing of design movement, what I feel. Now, some of the initiatives related to this movement. Arduino, we all know Arduino. It is an open source electronics platform based on easy to use hardware and software. Now it is compatible with any operating system which adds to its flexibility. Now this has proved to be very advantageous because of its simple, clear programming environment. The next is Instructables. Now it is a website having expertise in do-it-yourself projects and is now being owned and operated by Autodesk. It also has a forum in which the enthusiast can seek immediate answers to their questions. Other initiatives are Agua Clara, One Laptop Per Child, Open Course, Open Design Alliance. We also have Zoetrope. Zoetrope is an open and free vertical axis wind turbine, which is manufactured using common engineering materials. And believe me, it is open sourced. So next one is Via Open Book. Now it is a laptop design from VIA Technologies and its design of laptop case was published as an open source. Among few are Sensorica, Thingiverse, Open Structures and Open Source Ecology. Now some of the related work in the design movement. So this is an illustration from a paper written by D. Bhaskar, who presented a microcontroller-centered solar tracking system incorporating multiple functions for a solar cell. You can see how this system is made using household items such as boxes, cardboard. Now this is open design movement. So on your left, K. Govind Raju developed an innovative method for preventing rail accidents. An AVR controller, which works on the Kyle software, is used for this rail transport application. So the initial plan was to portray by using three distinct nodes and sensor duos in which databases of trains are identified. Now, if there is a slight mismatch in the IP address, it will automatically alarm the driver who can then stop the train automatically or manually by using a buzzer. On your right is an illustration from the paper written by Madhu Kazawan, 
who proposed an AVR centered control system which uses actual time data for logging temperature. On the top, MAA Mashud presented development and design of economical microcontroller centered single phased water pump device. Following it, N. Anjulatha developed a system in order to monitor the blood glucose level of our body. So this is achieved using a controller which is programmed using the most basic and simple C language. So as soon as the sample is injected in the measuring device, the blood glucose concentration is displayed on its screen. And from this, we get a fairly accurate and precise result. On your left, Abhir Abbasi used this movement to present a design of autopilot of an unmanned aerial vehicle built on free-scale microcontroller, following which Subita created a tracing system to find the need of human presence in crucial regions with the help of a controller, which is coded in C language. Mohammed Arif developed an AVR microcontroller based home automation system. So you can see the diagram, block diagram on your left. Mohammed Latif developed an Android application using Arduino microcontroller for a smartphone automated control system. The block diagram is shown on your right. So these are the few of the artworks that I have mentioned here. But if you want to know more such works in this movement, you can refer my review article. So here is a table of summary showing you different smart applications, the parameter that is uh, monitored, controller, and the software used. And this references I have purposely put uh, in 2012 or 2014 just to show you that, that this movement has already started to gain pace. Many of these smart applications were developed in the initial years of the last decade. So you may ask, well, though it is nascent and not well reached among the researchers today, it holds enormous potential for years to come. For example, tools like TensorFlow have helped to democratize machine learning by making machine learning something that is implementable within an enterprise. And with the advancement in technology, possibilities and opportunities to develop innovative software has only increased. Hence, this movement is bound to grow and get bigger. So you can see the illustration. So from this figure, we can see that the products are created by connecting companies and communities in a creative and productive open source development ecosystem, and thereby introducing open source hardware as a viable business strategy for the future. So here are the some references on which this review article is based upon. You can have a look. So with this, I hope you all must have understood the meaning of open design movement. It's two components, hardware and software. I also hope this brief presentation motivates you to incorporate this movement in your research. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aditya. So is there any query from audience? Ma'am, please. So, can you uh, highlight few research gaps from literature, Aditya? Sorry, ma'am. Few? Research gaps that you have identified from literature. Uh, yes, ma'am. The few research gaps are like, still this uh, movement is not well reached among the many researchers but as i have said in this uh, my motivation that is a lot of scope for future so there are many gaps which i mean cannot be identified as such but if we research more in this field i think we can uh, come up with a proper field of research as open design movements actually i'm still working on this movement and, and incorporating this in my uh, last year major project of mechanical engineering so what, what difficulties I found was that uh, by taking the data and uh, interfacing the hardware and software, it is usually difficult because not much information is available. We need to find there is still, this is the lack, I think, what I have found out till my experience. See, uh, Aditya, uh, there are no queries from my side, but uh, I would like to give you one suggestion that you should refer latest references related to your work. Because as I can see from the references, only 2014 papers you have referred, right? So I would like to advise you that you should yes, refer latest, latest 
references at least 30 to 40 in number and that references that literature should be the basis of your research work and uh, you should i mean uh, you should refer to those references and identify the research gaps based on these literature madam i am okay, the this paper uh, i would like to add some few few points uh, may i add some points i am yes, his yes, mentor yes. from college of engineering pune Yes. Actually, uh, the references which he has mentioned in the PPT are very few references. We have used total 65 references, mm -hmm. among which the main highlight of the research work is being added here. Actually, this open mm -hmm. design movement consists of some open source software, hardware, and their interfaces. So till now, we have found very less papers because this movement is emerging you know, technology which we need to you know research further so uh, the difficulty or as you correctly asked the research gap uh, you know of this uh, after uh, reviewing this paper is that the you know very new softwares and hardware in open source style they are available but their interfacing their real time implementation their validation people have not done uh, people have not done so this is the major problem which we can identify and which we can suggest from this paper that we, you can integrate open source hardware and software to make smart systems and then it can be implemented in real time. So more research must be carried out in this regard so that you know the end user himself can make that system at his home and thus there won't be any problem uh, uh, on the data equation system. So this is the main uh, research gap which we have found out. Okay, fine, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Your points are well taken, sir. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. So that is thank all you, from my side, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, okay. okay, thank you, Mr. Aditya. Uh, so the next thank paper you, ID is 91. Modeling resource allocation in uncertain system environment through deep re reinforcement learning by Neil Gandhi. Yeah, Mr. Neil Gandhi. Uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, please unmute yourself first. You are muted. Am I audible yeah. to you? Yeah, now you're audible. Uh, please share your screen. Yeah, sir. Sure. Sir, uh, is the screen visible? Uh, yeah, visible now. Just a second. Yeah, it is fair enough. Yes, okay. Please okay. Proceed. So here we are about to present a paper on uh, modeling resource allocation in uncertain in, uh, resource, uncertain system environment through deep reinforcement learning. The authors of the paper are Neil Gandhi and my uh, guide, um, Mr. Shakti Mishra, ma'am. So the, I am a student of Pandit Dinyal Petroleum University presenting this paper. So what is deep reinforcement learning? So deep reinforcement learning aims at achieving long-term rewards by mechanism of agent reacting with the environment and receiving an appropriate re, uh, reward mecha mechani through the mechanism of state transition and evaluative feedback. So this has been used for complex uh, machine learning problems and complex problems uh, where decisions are to be taken as illustrated by the figure an environment uh, is observed by the agent agent takes an action and a corresponding reward is received by using a policy uh, for the agent so deep reinforcement learning so we have used the deep reinforcement learning for the problem of uh, resource allocation where the environment is completely unknown and the uh, agent reacts with the environment to develop a suitable policy that has an aim to maximize the long-term reward. Also, we have taken into consideration the exploration and exploitation dilemma to, opt, uh, uh, to obtain the optimal results. Uh, we have found that we have, uh, in the start, we have used uh, supervised learning methods, unsupervised methods, and then we found out that reinforcement learning finds new dimensions of decision-making for the problem of resource allocation. Now, moving to the next thing is, uh, how uh, resource uh, reinforcement learning is applied. It is helpful in cases of mechatronics, robotics, and resource constraint environments. So the problem is uh, could not be effectively solved using the pre uh, predefined techniques and modern deep learning methods, but it has been solved using reinforcement learning in cases specific of uncertain system environment. So if the uh, environment is uncertain, the reinforcement learning has the ability to adapt to the new uncertain environment for prolonged amounts of time. So 
the literature sur uh, survey says that uh, people in the past have also used uh, reinforcement learning for the problem of starting and dynamic types of resource allocation for job schedulings in co computer clusters where the jobs have been scheduled in order then mobile edge computing robotics business process management uae and vehicle resource management and grid computing so the basic aim of this paper is to develop a framework that could be applied to any type of resource allocation problems with uh, initial settings that needed to be done so so the problem that, that we are going to solve is suppose there are m number of uh, m number of resources that are fixed and there are varying number of items that change with time so the aim of the agent is to allocate uh, one item to a particular one resource we have taken some constraints because it was the action space was developing huge so the agent identifies the greatest q value in such a way that the item does not require changes very frequently so the state space action space and re uh, reward space is uh, rewards are calculated the state space is m number of uh, items uh, m number of resources and varying number of items action space is 2 to the power m but which is a very large action space so we have reduced it using the reinforcement learning algorithms effectively and the rewards is capped a maximum at 0 because we are trying to minimize the loss in prolonged amount of time or infinite amount of times so the components of reinforcement learning model that we have used are deep q networks uh, that aim to increase the future rewards by selecting the greatest q value following a a Bellman's equation that is uh, displayed below. So this Bellman's equation is used to pick the action with the maximum Q value. Double DQ networks are used to improve the network architecture where current and the target Q are compared with the input features using policy net. In addition to the policy net, target net is also introduced to reduce the number of operations by a wire bill. Uh, bit and policy net uh, replicates itself after few iterations to improve the performance. Then we moved ahead. We also applied dueling deep Q network where policy net was split and one component was dedicated to the state value and the other was taken as the advantage in the difference of the Q values between the different actions for the process of resource allocation. Aggregation was used for taking the best suitable action that was possible from different policy uh, different nets. Noisy layers were effective in this problem specifically uh, to get rid of epsilon greedy and they are also found very effective in uncertain environments. Prioritized replay is not used because it uh, focuses more on minimizing the loss, but in uncertain environments, we have found that it is not very suitable. Now, bootstrap aggregation or bagging was also used to train our model. Different samples were taken uh, on the same memory and having different starting weights, as well as trained on different bootstrap networks from that memory. So actions were taken uh, with random choice or most commonly by the aggregator. In our case, the most commonly used, act, uh, most commonly recommended action was taken by us. So moving to the, our proposed model, that is the noisy bootstrap aggregation, uh, double deep uh, learning queue learning approach. So it proved to be superior in comparison to other models. The noisy layers were used for Epsilon greedy uh, to as an alternative to explore epsilon greedy exploration. Dual in nature was helpful in getting the state value as well as the difference in the Q values between different axes and uh, get the greatest Q value. Now moving to the next step, uh, that is, we also get uh, what bagging that was helpful in aiding the steps of uh, exploration and noisy bootstrap aggregation approach was effective in terms of reward as well as efficiency for the problem of resource allocation. So the algorithm that we have proposed or the algorithm that we have used for this purpose is we have created a simulation environment, then we have created the memory, then we have created the policy net and the target net, then we have trained the episodes and uh, we have took various bootstrap samples uh, were trained on the same memory but different weights. Then we have added some noise to it. And then we have uh, we uh, then we go into the while loop. Then we recommend the action from the policy net increase the time step in, in simulation. As this uh, is an infinite simulation, but we have stopped till 500 or 600 epochs. Then we receive the next state reward terminal information from the simulation. Store that information. Update the policy net. Update the target net. And this 
is how we evaluate our performance of the whole network now the results we have compared eight uh, we have took eight algorithms for our comparison we have started from the most basic one the research papers are available till the third one that is double dq learning d, uh, d3q learning noisy d3q learning but we extended to about five algorithms and we found out that our proposed noisy bootstrap aggregation d3q learning was provided the best results in comparison to other d3 learning approaches so we can clearly here see that for it provided us constant rate with a high relatively high accuracy of 97 percent after 100 epochs and continued uh, later after in, also in cases of uncertain environment where it, it explored the complete environment in the start of the experiment now coming to the resource uh, utilization so we have observed that uh, noisy layers prove to be effective in cases of resource allocation but prioritize replay didn't prove to be much effective in the cases and the prioritized you play uh, didn't prove to be effective in the cases of uncertain environment where the resources and the items were not allocated in an optimal manner and there were a uh, large number of non-performing resources now coming to the comparison table as we can clearly compare uh, we have co clearly compared according to the time period under capacity time period over capacity average items performing average uh, resources utilized and efficiency of the system and our proposed system clearly outperforms all the other systems in terms of efficiency uh, and other parameters so next yeah so i would like to acknowledge uh, uh, the, and present my gratitude to the committee members of IRMS conference, anonymous reviewers of our paper, VIT Chennai and Pandit Dindyal Petroleum University for providing the support for presenting the, our paper. The references from the paper are taken from right from uh, recent references to uh, references up to the year 2016-14. So a number of references are provided and thank you. We are open to question and answers. Uh, thank you, Gandhi. So, is there any questions from audience? Uh, Ma'am, please. So, very well presented, uh, Mr. Neil Gandhi. Uh, so, I just want to know, uh, are you doing your master's or you are pursuing your PhD? Ma'am, actually, I am a third year undergrad student at Pandit Dindyal Petroleum University. Commendable then. In that case, like too much of work you have done, it is commendable. So, um, so I just wanted to know about the future scope of your work. Sir, ma'am, actually, uh, I want to develop a framework which can be utilized by various industries which are suffering from the problem of resource allocation. And this would be helpful in industries where uh, the uncertainty is on the next level, like stock markets or any other types of uh, environments where uncertainty is there. Reinforcement learning can be proved to be very effective in such cases. We have developed a framework and the, this algorithm is most effective in uncertain environment. We have found out that for resource allocation. Also, this can be helpful in COVID, uh, COVID patient bed management that one of my junior is doing this such project using mm -hmm. my algorithm. So it is, it was also very effective in that cases of resource allocation. Okay. Fine. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Gandhi. So the uh, next paper ID is uh, 129, uh, design of a low-cost system for determination of fat using IoT and ML by Alfia Patil. Yeah, Alfia, uh, please share your screen. Yes, sir. Sir, is the screen visible? Hello? Alfia? You know, audible. Uh, hello, can you sir, speak loudly? Screen, uh, hello, sir. Is the screen visible? Yeah, the screen is visible now. Okay. Okay, so. Uh, please keep the mic uh, near to your mouth. Ah, uh, yes. 
Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Alfia Patel from Wachand Institute of Technology, Sholapur. Uh, my work is on design of a low cost system for determination of uh, fat using IoT and ML. Uh, basically, this idea came to our head uh, when we were looking for our final year project ideas and we saw that uh, farmers go and get their milk fat checked before selling it to the vendors from where it is sent to the uh, industries where uh, milk is packaged. But the machines which are used for uh, the fat measurement in these uh, uh, industries, they are pretty expensive. And as you can see, I have mentioned here, they start from about 25,000 and in bigger industries, they are available in lakhs as well. So knowing the importance of milk in our lives, it is an essential commodity. In day-to-day -day, uh, life, we require, uh, we consume a lot of milk and various milk products. Now milk contains a lot of nutrients, uh, solid fat, solid non-fat protein, carbs, etc. cetera. Uh, since milk has 87% of water in it, it is very easy easily prone to adulteration. So what these farmers do is they, add, they sometimes add uh, sugar to it in order to increase its fat or some chemicals. The adulterating this, they increase their fat and uh, ultimately they sell it to a higher costs. So for this, uh, due to this thing, uh, the measurement of fat in the initial level at the vendors is to be done because what these vendors do is they collect milk from these farmers, they adulterate it and sell to the industries. So farmers uh, uh, stay at loss. Now, uh, because of this adulteration thing that goes on in the industry, testing and analysis of milk becomes a very important aspect in such a case. Now, when it when we speak about testing and anal analyzing milk, what we actually mean is determining the fat content of the milk because the milk is sold in the uh, market on the basis of the percentage of fat it has in it. So determination of the fat is the most important criteria while analyzing the milk. Now milk analyzers determine uh, available in the market determine various parameters such as fat, uh, the uh, solid non-fat. Uh, solid non-fat is not an uh, essential uh, part of the milk which is important to the industry. Apart from that, there's temperatures that, that is meant, uh, measured and the yeah, water content. Are not moving. In this slide you are right now. For, uh, introduction, yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So water content in the milk, etc. These are the parameters which are measured by the analyzers that exists right now. Now, when we did literature review in order to like start our project and get ideas as to which type of uh, milk analyzer we should go for, how we could reduce its cost, there were few points that we uh, came to know from these uh, papers that we read. First thing, spectroscopy principle, it is the uh, least used principle in the measurement of milk fat because uh, there, uh, when people did research on spectroscopy, they came to a conclusion that results that are obtained using uh, the spectroscopic principle give a lot of variations when actual testing is done. So there is a lot of variations in the result, but no measures were taken to somehow counter the variation and get to a stable result. And from the papers itself, we learned about uh, implementation of electronics into this using Arduino microcontrollers uh, in which people had used Arduino, but they what they did was the output that Arduino was getting, they just uh, prepared a graph of uh, Arduino output against the fat of the milk they were testing. So they did not, uh, do uh, put any uh, extra efforts to uh, make sure that the new sample that we put in uh, into check will uh, because of any other factors get affected and give the right reading or not and regarding the selection of sensors we read about the usage of uh, ldr sensor and ir sensor uh, for the uh, spectroscopy uh, experiment that were done apart from that uh, we learned about various different methods of uh, the method uh, measurement of fat, which include the Gerber method, which is a chemical testing method. And there was ultrasonic testing method. Now the ultrasonic testing methods, which are generally used in the market, are the reason why the fat uh, analyzers cost in lakhs. Now, the purpose of 
uh, us building this milk analyzer we had three main points in our head we thought of giving a more reliable uh, concept of fat measurement which could uh, give accurate reading to various range of samples because few papers we read they were only giving the fat percentage for a limited range like 4 4 to 6% of fat they would tell or 6 to 8% so we didn't want to restrict ourselves to that much so that was first aim then reducing cost was a major aim because uh, they were costing pretty high and because of which affordability to uh, the uh, to people had become very low and we saw that these uh, analyzers which are used by the vendors are really compact and portable so we didn't want to build a bulky uh, setup in the beginning ideas that we were thinking of for making the setup bulky so we made it as uh, we noted that we won't make it uh, a bulky one now the proposed work there are uh, three things first is the fat determination technique using iot and machine learning which i will uh, which i will be shortly explaining in detail then reducing the response time was uh, our one of the aim because the machines that we took the samples for making our data set were appro taking approximately 1 minute 1 and 1/2 minute for giving results and gerber method which gives which is uh, so, which gives uh, the most accurate uh, results it takes about 5 minute per sample so it is a lot of time getting wasted to measure fat of a given sample and it was uh, giving a low cost milk analyzer the last aim in this now let me briefly explain the construction of the setup that we have completed up till now uh, as we can see there is this uh, controller the which we have connected to ldr and leds in the right figure you can see a cuvette in this cuvette we fill the milk sample about uh, 4 to 5 ml of sample gets accumulated into it uh, the light from the led falls on the cuvette now the spectroscopy principle basically states that when light falls on the milk sample the uh, only the fat molecules in the milk are large enough to scatter the light from the led so the protein molecules and the other particles that are present in the milk are so small that they won't scatter the light so basically the amount of light getting scattered is directly related to the fat content of the milk now the amount of light that is reached uh, after scattering is re received by the ldr and we establish a relation between these ldr readings and the fat percentage known fat percentage of the milk that we put in the sample to build our model now what we uh, what we do is uh, light uh, here i have stated the working principle that scattering of light from led by fat globules present in the uh, homogenized milk is the basic principle now we can see that light reaches the uh, milk present inside the cuvette then yes, ldr yeah, receives uh, two minutes yes uh, two minutes okay minute yes uh, the uh, ldr receives the light then uh, uh, in the end we had used raspberry pi because we went, uh, we wanted to use machine learning algorithm uh, in the uh, raspberry pi process the data uh, there we had already uh, trained a model which had known fat values and the corresponding uh, ldr values to it when we put an unknown sample uh, we got the output uh, which was very close to the output which we got on the actual machine which i'll which i'll be showing in the next slide the first image is of the machine the first value that you can see 8.1 in this machine is the actual output for the sample and in this output screen on the right you can see 8.1 which is uh, the fat percentage uh, obtained for the same sample we did the same experiment just to extend the project before doing it on machine learning we tried it to do on matlab and the result for uh, result which we got on matlab was also pretty good uh, it was showing 8.02 but since our aim was to increase the accuracy we stuck ourselves to using random forest algorithm for this and we got uh, satisfactory results uh, this is from my side thank you uh, thank you alfia uh, for the nice presentation so is there any query from audience Okay, uh, ma'am, uh, do we have any query? 
So Alfia, it was a good presentation and the topic is also very good. So, uh, can you tell me uh, the future scope of your work? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, I believe there is a lot of scope. Now being uh, uh, bachelor students, we did not have the opportunity to go to good industry and take like uh, uh, as many as samples we could take. But I believe with using, with uh, by trying other algorithms and by trying to find other methods for fat determination, the cost can be reduced drastically because uh, the image that you could see in the presentation that machine costs about 25000 and our model that we are building up till now we have spent only 4000 and since we are going to add other features to it it will overall it will cost us 8000 so you can see the cost difference so if people keep on coming up with such ideas or just coming up with algorithms that could improve its accuracy there is a lot of scope to this uh, project yes yes very true. So uh, can you tell us, tell me the size of the data set used by you? Ma'am, as I told you, unfortunately, wherever we would go, uh, being students, no one was that willing to let us have the uh, samples collected because that was disturbing their work. But still, somehow we managed to collect about 200 to 250 samples uh, for our uh, this data set building uh, which is not at all enough we are still searching for places uh, there are here, there are few industries available around we are trying to contact so that we get more samples i'm highly impressed with your work alfia because you. uh, matlab, being data set is a disadvantage because you are not able to get the proper data set otherwise yeah. deep learning uh, could be applied to this project also. exactly ma'am unfortunately what had happened we looked for data set in this project we searched a lot on web but no one has ever used tried to use machine learning for this project people have just limited themselves to trying iot and then left it there it could so, have done uh, maybe in future you will be able to do wonders in this area right yeah we are actually planning to make it a, a better product like we are planning to make a product out of this project. Okay, okay. All the Sophia, best. Uh, no? I have one query. Ah, yes. Uh, regarding the number of authors in your paper. Ah, yes, sir. I, I can see that uh, around uh, six to seven authors uh, is there in your paper. Yes, sir. So, uh, is there real contribution of all to six to seven authors or uh, uh, just for the friendship you have given the name of all the authors? No, no. No, sir. Uh, three of them are professor. They were the guides. Actually, I, I come from mechanical branch and in our college for mechanical students, we do not have these many facilities. So, professors arranged uh, sessions to understand this algorithm concepts and the other three members who have worked with me on this project uh, they have helped tremendously in collecting samples because it was a task we used to go six o'clock in the morning okay samples don't finish their farmers would come early at five o'clock six o'clock and we, have, we had to rush okay, okay. Uh, thank you but uh, thank still you. my suggestion is that uh, in future whenever you write the research paper please try to limit uh, up to four maximum four Okay, uh, sir. Authors, okay, I'll, uh, I'll keep that in mind, sir. Uh, please try to limit that. Uh, okay. Okay, 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 thank you okay. very much. Thank you, so, sir. So, uh, uh, next paper is the uh, it will be last paper of this session. The paper ID is 130 a comprehensive review on low cost smart systems based on an open source platform, uh, Arudino by Aditya Patil. Yes, that sir. Uh, my screen is visible, right? Yeah, screen is visible. Uh, can you switch on your webcam? Uh, just a second. Aditya, uh, can you switch on your webcam? Uh, yes, sir. Aditya, Aditya, you are not audible. Uh, yes, sir. I'm trying. Just a second. Uh, is it visible now? Yeah, yeah, visible now. Yeah, I'll just share the screen. Okay. Uh, please proceed. Uh, yes. So, a very good afternoon to one and all present here. Hope you are all in good health. 
So today I Aditya Patel, uh, final year BTEC mechanical student from College of Engineering Pune, will be presenting a review article on the topic, a comprehensive review on low cost smart systems based on an open source platform, Arduino. So uh, along with me, this paper has been co-authored by Abhishek Patange, Sujit Pardeshi, Rudvet Vakchavre, Aditya Meri, and Rudra Shegu from College of Engineering Pune, and also Dr. Jagadishwaran from VIT Chennai. So the flow of today's talk will be, I'll be beginning with the introduction of the smart systems along with the motivation uh, Aditya, for this. Uh, can you speak loudly? Uh, am I audible now? You are audible, but uh, it's too low. Uh, even now? Okay, please proceed. Yeah, so after that, we'll be looking as uh, to, towards Arduino as an open source hardware and the open source software. And then we'll move forward to the related work in smart systems based on Arduino. And then we'll be ending the talk by summarizing the work and find uh, and the findings and the future scope of the technology. So in an era of intelligent technology, a system that makes decisions in an adaptive or predictive manner is gaining more attention. Such systems are broadly termed as smart systems, which integrate a variety of sensors, actuators, and control strategies. The term smartness is featured with autonomous activities through different types of activities like networking capabilities, energy efficiency, and closed loop controls to name a few. So smart system basically combines the segment of machine accuracy and human cognition, putting forward in various applications uh, ranging from construction, manufacturing, aerospace to healthcare, and ICT, which are versatile and dynamic. In all this about mentioned domains, there has been increasing utilization of smart systems over the recent past, which can be credited to the fact that smart systems reduce challenges pertaining on a global level, which are man-made climatic changes, waste, or medical care. The IoT technology, wherein object is pre object present and even every person is in interconnected via the internet, will become more feasible due to the ease of smart system integration process. So the smart system integration process is combination of various smart systems, which is helped by the fact that sensors are available today are increasing in power and reducing in size with other smart components. The process of automating repetitive tasks such as data collection, uh, maintenance, and re reporting will help to streamline various multidimensional business processes, in turn helping to assemble workforce into adding value. So my major motivation for this article is in, even though this smart technology is gaining more attention, in order to implement it in a real time, an adaptive and economically viable solution is must. Smart systems provide greater flexibility in the sense that they can be incorporated in various domains, as I mentioned before. An organization, apart from the ability to monitor aspect of device and consumer behavior, can also reduce their cost through predictive maintenance and eliminate waste. And these organizations then can uh, move their focus towards innovation through robust work processes and structural efficiency. In the last few years, Arduino as an open source platform has become relatively popular, and it can be incorporated into a wide variety of smart systems. Even in this session, we have seen various papers using Arduino as their data acquisition system, because it also breaks the stigma that handling of such technology is complex and expensive, while Arduino is quite cheap and easily, easy to handle. So let us see Arduino as an open source hardware. So it can be described as a cir circuit board that is open source and programmable, which consists of a microcontroller ability to be programmed, and it can communicate with various outputs such as motors, displays, LEDs, by responding to inputs and sensors. And it is comparative low of cost and is flexible in nature. So Massimo Banzi from Italy has been credited for introducing this technology to the world. It consists of a ready-made software known as Arduino IDE, which will be look forward. And it is capable of reading digital or analog inputs from a variety of sensors. It delivers a standard that helps to divide the functionality of the microcontroller in more accessible manner. And it has an added advantage of no requirement of any extra hardware. So different Arduino comes in variety of boards depending on the microcontroller. So ba basic differences in this board are in number of outputs and inputs. And also they differ on various operating factors like operating voltage, speed, form factor. So most commonly used Arduino boards are Arduino Uno, Arduino Mega, Arduino Nano, Arduino Mini, Arduino Lilipad, and Arduino Leonardo. 
So this table basically differentiates this on the basis of their memory processor, operating voltage, etc. So according to the need of the project, we can choose the suitable Arduino board. And these are the Arduino board, which I mentioned just before. This is the schematic representation of the spin diagram of Arduino Uno board. Moving forward, let us look at Arduino as an open source software. So Arduino comes with an open source software known as Arduino IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. So the purpose of the software is to write and compile the code. It has the compiler and editor option in it. And Arduino IDE is uh, advanced in uh, C and C++ languages. So it is, e it is very easy for programming without having any advanced programming knowledge. And major advantage is that it runs on the Java platform, which has comes with inbuilt commands and functions that play a pivotal role for compiling, debugging, and editing any code. So it is easily accessible and can be easily downloaded for free of cost from Arduino's official website. Moving forward, so let us look into some related work in this field of smart system based on Arduino boards. So here we can see uh, M. Funtis and his author proposed a new data collection system for the purpose of monitoring solar PV systems. So the parameter they choose were the for the system were voltage, current, power and temperature using the temperature sensors, voltage sensors, current sensors, interfacing it with the Arduino board and using a C program to collect the data through the sensor. So here we can see uh, aside their data acquisition system. Moving forward, Jorge Correa and his uh, co-authors presented a paper for implementation of new open architecture controller for CNC systems based on open source hardware, that is the Arduino board, this system is based on major, measuring, me measuring the interpolated and feedback trajectories. Using the Arduino board, uh, they have interfaced this. And as we can see here, the DC servo motor uh, for that, they have uh, connected it to the controller of the Arduino. Uh, Majid Karami and his co-author suggested a system which helps to monitor the indoor environmental quality and assess the performance of the uh, indoor surroundings. So the major parameters in consideration for this experiments were temperature, carbon dioxide, VOC. And these parameters were monitored using temperature sensor and humidity sensor, which were interfaced with, again with the Arduino Uno microcontroller and an XB device. So the communication between the Arduino and the XB device was set up using the Zigbee, uh, Zigbee software. And the software program Voltron was used for the analysis of the collected data. Here we can see the data acquisition system. Moving forward, Vasily Des Desnitsky and Igor Kotenko proposed a system for monitoring the structural state of elements of hydraulic structure. So here they have considered a hydraulic structure, which is the dam, and they have used the Arduino controller and used the parameters such as pressure, temperature, vibration, and bending for monitoring the health of this uh, dam. And in that in their paper, they have through their experiments, they have proved that this system which they have constructed is is quite operable in practice. Moving forward, Talha Agalkayazi suggested a method for building a sensor characterization platform for multi-access stress in order to okay, decrease the two time minutes required remaining. Two minutes for, remaining. for development of uh, development and also incorporate precise benchmarking. So here we can see their Arduino Uno board and the power connectors which have, they have installed along with the safety switch. As this, as this figure suggests, uh, they have built a compact structure and for the stress characterization, using their uh, work, they can characterize stress, either a normal or shear stress, according to the graph plotted from the data collected. So moving forward, we have uh, I have worked on another uh, papers like this one, which is for the paper for monitoring and storing of the post welding data parameters done by various sensors and microcontrollers. This is their schematic presentation with the microcontroller and the sensor. Again, here it's a, another paper presented for an inexpensive system for online process, controlling and monitoring for ensuring stable and e efficient biogas production. So they, this is their schematic presentation of their uh, structure. So this is the summary of the uh, work I have discussed. I have divided into the various columns of application, your presentation. parameter and sensor use. Yeah, so concluding their findings and future scope. So the Arduino technology helps in breaking the notion that microcontrollers are difficult to operate. Arduino boards are 
an open source entity both in hardware and software front which makes it easier to operate for even uh, people from non engineering backgrounds so in today's world the need for an inexpensive system is rising and the arduino technology is quite efficiently catering to this need this paper advocates that the arduino technology has the potential to be used in various field as a primary choice for implementation of the smart system projects and in recent year the arduino technology has boomed onto the scene as a major cheap and simple option although the application is still frivolous but the current advances highlight that the it has the holds enormous potential in field of technology like internet of things and intelligent technology so these are the references i have used uh, for this paper Uh, these are only just some few of the papers. In overall, in my article, I have uh, given a study of almost forty plus article uh, article papers regarding the use of Arduino as a smart system. Thank you. Yeah, ma'am, please. Okay, so Aditya, it was a good paper, and uh, you have uh, cited all the references. I just want to give one advice to you that you should include years. here in the uh, whenever you cite any references in the related work you should mention the year also uh yes ma'am actually years are here i mean it's not clearly visible uh, you are correct but uh the papers i have used is mostly from the year 2019 to 2021 yes that i have seen so that is why i mentioned ki it, it was a good review paper so thank you so much this is all from my side aditya thank you yes, okay uh, so thank you all the participants uh, we have presented all the eight papers uh, for this session uh, now i request to uh, professor dipali gupta uh, to uh, summarize the session and uh, please announce the best paper award of uh, this particular session so it's a and tough job uh, well uh, it's been a pleasant day today and uh, really enthralling for me because i have organized plenty of conferences and attended a lot of such conferences in different capacity um, i can surely say that it was a very different experience due to the way the organizers organized the conferences particularly you uh, gajanan sir and uh, uh, saravan kumar sir and uh, uh, the quality of research work presented here is really uh, commendable uh, so i especially I would like to mention the name of Miss Alfia Patel uh, and Miss Norsia Figa and Mr. Neil Gandhi, whose research work are really in line with what is required today, and they should continue to explore more in their area. And I'll be more than happy if I could be of any help to them. And I must appreciate, and it is an example for everyone that young researchers. me scholars and btech scholars are taking keen interest in research which is really the need of the hour and furthermore i am delighted that people are doing in the interdisciplinary research which is quite futuristic and is also required for best and scalable results i must also advise all the young researchers that you should kindly relate your research work to some tangible product or service which can bring comfort or safety or security or prosperity to the human beings so um in this session uh, eight papers were presented and every delegate presented their work well and in timely manner thank you so much we heard a lot of research related work related to vanets iot monkeys uh, work also driver skill assessment cattle fodder open design movement research allocation and smart systems <clears throat> but uh, according to me uh, although it was a tough decision paper id 66 66 presented by mr arjun sevu should be considered as the best paper in this session and i was highly impressed by his work and his idea is really beneficial for society so once again i declare paper id 66 as the best paper in the session presented by mr arjun and his topic was iot based intelligent control of hydroponic setup for livestock rearing he was from school of mechanical engineering 
वी आई टी वेल लॉर चेन्नई तो I congratulate him for getting best paper award in this session. Now, um, with my experience, one more advice I would like to give all of you that technology is changing at a very fast pace. Hence, we must concentrate upon learning to learn skills more than learning a technology. So, with these words, I would once again congratulate you all and the organizers. for organizing such a wonderful conference and thank you all for having me here thank you thank you very much ma'am and uh, congratulations to mr arjun and his guide uh, professor murli mohan ji uh, to get the best paper for this particular session uh, thank you very much ma'am uh, for uh, once again for accepting our invitation and uh, being part of this particular session thank, thank you, you very much thank you thank Now you i would like to come to sarvana sir Yeah, thank you, thank you. Once, once more, I have to thank say thank you, the Bali Madam, for accepting our invitation, being the uh, session chair here. So I like to thank you, and uh, uh, your remarks was quite uh, very good, and uh, it will be inspiring for all the others to take up the further research into it. Thank you, thank you very much, Madam. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, Madam. Thank you, uh, uh, everyone. Now we'll uh, have the session uh, six starting here in the same ID. So other sessions will be starting uh, parallelly. So the sessions will be starting exactly by four uh, p.m. So I just request you to uh, join back then. Okay. Thank you, uh, else. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you much. I'm leaving this session now. I'm. Uh, yes. Thank you. Yes, madam. Uh, we'll get back to you shortly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay.